Um, today, uh, I think we were going to talk about um, what we call a. Uh, I, can we go with the term uh, RAM clinic? Because yeah, that seems I think to be that's the universal. Ontario. Ontario. Yeah, we use Ontario. They, I think that's one they've taken up in Alberta as well. Okay, and that uniform. stands for yeah, Rapid Access Addiction uh, Medicine uh, Clinic. Okay, and uh, these are clinics uh, spread everywhere. Yes, uh, but there there are a lot of them in in Ontario, uh, and there are these drop in clinics that have certain hours that you can just drop into, and you can get an assessment or treatment for an alcohol or an opiate use uh, disorder. Uh, so it's government funded, you know, and most of the meds are government funded too. They're government funded if you're under 24 in Ontario, and also if um, your income's at a certain level, uh, after a certain amount you pay the rest. And if you're on Ontario Works, which is I guess our welfare, uh, and uh, or Ontario Disability, you have it fully covered as well. And so you get seen, you get started on treatment that day, and they'll uh, you know provide anti-craving medications, withdrawal, and sometimes they'll do some case management or counseling, depending. Yeah, and uh, so uh, you know, I've worked in one for uh, for I think about four years of my uh, of my yep. time in this field, and um, you know, I, I just you know blindly figured that well, everyone's got yeah, these you know, this places. Is, uh, the standard of this, this, this is, is where is everyone's got them, right? And then. Uh, I had the privilege of going to, um, I, well, at the first conference we went to together, which was CSAM, and got to meet some of my, you know, colleagues across uh, across yeah, the yeah. province, and and I, you know, kind of mentioned, oh yeah, well, why don't you just send them to the <laughs> to the RAM clinic? Yeah. They're like, what? What? And they not only do they not have a RAM clinic, which was astonishing enough, but they didn't even know yeah. what a RAM clinic was, which yeah. is like wow. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah so yeah. I was really quite amazed at that, and um, so I, you know, how lucky we are to kind of have that kind of barrier for. And I, and I, the key about all these 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 clinics, in my opinion, is it's kind of a barrier free thing. You can go like our the clinic that I worked at. It's open five days a week from nine to eleven every morning. No appointments necessary. Just got to get yourself there. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and you're going to see an addiction doctor usually within 25, 30 minutes, and you're going to be in there getting the care that you need. And so you don't have to make an appointment. You don't have to, you know, deal with uh, stigma in different ways. You don't have to have any money. You don't have to, you know, it, it literally is just get to the door and you get the care. Yeah, yeah, and and you know it's it's one of those things that we we do take for granted because they're 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 everywhere, um, but there were forms like this uh, before uh, before uh, as well. So so I finished my my fellowship at uh, CAMH I think maybe in uh, 20, uh, 2012. and for about a year I would see people in the emergency department uh, there, right? And sometimes I'd you know prescribe buprenorphine or other medications, but we didn't have a RAM clinic back then, and so I literally had to uh, send an email to the admin uh, to book an appointment at a different site. I would have them come back and follow up in a couple of days there because that connection is so important to get these things uh, started. And and the way that the, the RAM clinics came up in Ontario was very, very uh, interesting. And we could talk a bit about that, but just guide me a bit based on your, your curiosity. So in, in Ontario back in 2010, there was a lot of clinics that provided methadone uh, treatment. Uh, some of these clinics had certain drop-in slots, but usually you had to call, you had to book an initial assessment. Sometimes you start methadone uh, maybe a week later. Some of them were designed so you could just drop in. There was a couple of clinics I know, even before this RAM clinic model came out, that were actually drop-in clinics. You could yes. drop in. As, uh, some of the clinics would be uh, from like 5 to 7 a.m. Some would be like uh, 5 to 8 p.m. on certain days, you know, just because people do work uh, as well. A lot of people do work uh, on it. Uh, and it was a slow evolution back then, where it was primarily methadone. And then over the course of five, uh, seven years, a lot of them started off for buprenorphine, which is another treatment for opiate use uh, disorder. Uh, and then after that, then they started adding anti-cravings for alcohol. Some of them added withdrawal management for uh, alcohol. And, and then it went from there. And, and it's fascinating. So in, in, in Ontario, uh, what ends up happening, and it's probably like this in Canada, uh, all of the health care is government funded. Right, and so if you have a health card and you come and see me, I can bill. I don't know if it's twenty dollars, thirty dollars, whatever it is, uh, per um, per per visit. And and a lot of these hospitals back then were not offering this care at all. Right. So they'd have a cardiology department, they'd have a nephrology department, they didn't have an addiction department. And so there were certain docs that were running these uh, clinics. And I would argue that that's why um, when the opiate crisis hit, we didn't have the deaths that you had in BC right away because there was all these methadone clinics uh, everywhere. And 
And so it was these clinics. So what, what happens is uh, it's just like a family practice. So if I have my own family practice, uh, I can bill the government a certain amount of dollars per visit I have. And then out of that money I'm billing the government, uh, I can put towards like renting a place, hiring a nurse, that kind of stuff. In the hospital, we save all those costs, right? Because the hospitals get tons of money from the government. Usually we can just work there and not sort of uh, charge them. And so back then, they primarily did, did methadone. And there was a drop-in clinic um, at St. Joseph's Health Center. Uh, it was a sort of, I think, built with uh, Melka Hahn and uh, Eric uh, Solway was, was the chief there. And then they did a small pilot study at St. Michael's uh, this, Hospital. Sorry, there's two St. Joe's. Is this the one that is in, in Etobicoke Toronto. that's kind of connected with? Yeah, 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 yeah Etobicoke. Okay, okay, because there's one in Hamilton too. That's why I yeah, get confused. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, so Melka Hahn, I think back in the 90s or something, started an addiction consult service there, right? I think it was the first one in, in Ontario. But he also set up a drop-in addiction uh, clinic. And uh, so they, they would come in for a drop-in. They had two-hour slots, I think on Tuesday, Thursday, different times. Times. And then once you came for your first visit, all your future ones were scheduled, right, for it. Okay. And then uh, Raj Gupta and Mel got funding for a small study, I don't know what they called it, HSOAP, to have a drop-in like clinic at St. Mike's as well. This is back in 2011, 2012, 2013. Okay. And so Mel and his team put together this Arctic grant. It's A-R-T-I-C. And what it is, it's like a... It's for about 900,000. And they did a pilot study where they got six places to roll out these RAM clinics. Okay. So uh, they they had one in uh, one in Sudbury, one in um, Ottawa, uh, one in uh, Blue Water. They, they had about six of them there. Okay. And so when they got funding for... Now, were those hospital-based? Uh, like blue... Like those linked. They were loosely linked. Loosely, li- loosely were, linked. Were they physically yeah. in a hospital? So, so it, it all depended on the local context, Okay, so not right? necessarily. No, no. Okay. A lot of times what it was is these methadone clinics would amp up to offer those other services. So they said, hey, these are the standards. You have to treat alcohol withdrawal. You have to offer anti-craving medications. Okay. And so they would do... So they had like... It was a two-year uh, project. Uh, they had about um, six, uh, six sites uh, and it was quite promising. And then... Some Somehow, I don't know how he did it, Malka Han and this group called Metafi, M-E-T-A-P-H-I, they got additional funding to roll out these RAM clinics all over the province. And one of the challenges is that even though any MD can learn the skill and provide it, not, MDs weren't doing this. A lot of MDs weren't doing methadone, they weren't doing buprenorphine, they weren't doing those other things. And then, so yeah, he rolled out these these RAM clinics. There was all these uh, little initiatives. So in Toronto, they had some funding to to make it open to everybody. So when I started working where you work uh, uh, now, uh, back then we could only see people that had been seen in the eMERGE or had been admitted to hospital. We couldn't see anybody off the street. Oh, okay. So yeah. that was the initial criteria was you yeah. needed to have that that's how, they, that's how they got the funding, right? Because okay. they were trying to reduce emergency uh, visits, Makes right? Sense. Makes uh, sense. And then, uh, you know, uh, then uh, the, Mel got a small amount of uh, funding. I think I was the uh, the, le- the lead at, at that time of it. And then I just kept going to every meeting saying, no, oh, it's the standard. It's the standard. We have to have it drop in for uh, for everybody. And it slowly sort of uh, evolved. Um, the case manager thing wasn't an essential part of the RAM. So, I mean, the way I sort of see these RAM clinics, it's almost like, you know, Tim Horton's uh, coffee. But eventually, you know, you might want to offer cappuccinos, you might want to offer sandwiches, you might want to offer other stuff, but not necessarily because you want to make money, but because that's what people uh, people need. Okay. And it sort of spread. I still remember, I think it was in 2018 or 19 in Vancouver, uh, I was chatting with uh, Rob Tange and... Uh, um, another uh, medicine uh, person from Alberta and then they saw Mel's presentation and they were just like, their eyes were like open, wow, what is this? And I think within a year they found a way to roll it out in uh, Alberta. And this may not be the actual timeline, but really what it is, it's individual places just doing a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. And some of the stuff that you see as being just normal standard of care was not back then. No, no, clearly. Now, so uh, a couple things of that. So so you say for a fact it's in BC? Yeah, yeah, they have some in BC uh, now, um, but I don't know if they call it RAM or or not. Um, they definitely have it in California, but they call it something completely different. They call these bridge clinics. Okay. And so it's uh, basically based out of the eMERGE. So it, once you're seen in the eMERGE, there's a five days a week, eight hours a day clinic you can drop into right. that'll continue your buprenorphine. But the thing is, you know, uh, JP, with these clinics, it's not clear what each of them offer. Right. Right. So some might just do buprenorphine. Uh, there's regulations in the states around methadone, so not all of them do methadone. Right. When they started here, a lot of them had nurse practitioners, so they'd only do buprenorphine, not methadone, not slow release oral morphine. Okay. And uh, not things like that. So I I, I was at the CCSA uh, summit in Ottawa, and yep. I uh, sat with a, a table from a bun- with a bunch of colleagues from uh, Quebec, Montreal in particular. Nothing. They yeah, got, yeah, yeah. yeah. So nothing. it hasn't it hasn't fully uh, spread. So a lot and of these times, are addiction providers full time. That's what they do, and they're like literally we're not aware of the model. 
Yeah, and, and I'm not yeah. trying to call them out because they were wonderful people. No, like, no, they, they all are. They all yeah. are. But the thing is, you know, that like, you can't just create this within a hospital setting. Right. You can't just say, "Hey, I want a drop-in clinic five days a week, three hours a day, where anybody can come." You have to remember every hour that we had, everything. You know, like it's 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 been a slow process to sort of uh, sort of build. Right. Yes, I know there was some viability things. I know that there, you know, some of the some of your colleagues had to, you know, fight for stipends and stuff because sometimes there would be hours where they wouldn't have a patient. When you start rolling anything out, it takes yeah, time yeah, yeah. to get buy in. So you, you know, people got to pay their mortgages, and I, and I get all that. So, I, but, but I mean, you can work around that, right? Like, the, the, and, and we did ultimately. But I mean, yeah. you're right. Everything is everything is a process. Um, so the 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 piece that I was kind of interested in that you um, uh, alluded to just at the beginning here was I didn't see the connection. I mean, it's quite an obvious one actually in hindsight, but of the, the, to the uh, methadone clinics. Now the methadone clinics and help me understand this, um, don't have the best reputation, uh, for what, for what reason? Or, or do you do you know that? Or yeah, have you heard so, that? so 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 I know this. This is where uh, where it's it's sort of tricky tricky for me to, to figure know. out how to sort of say. So you don't want to <laughs> you don't want to be criticizing colleagues at all, because uh, because I I truly believe that Ontario had phenomenal access to methadone around 2015 16 when those overdoses started to go up. Okay, right. So between 2014 16, it was everywhere. Like every city uh, had a methadone clinic. Definitely, sometimes 100%. you have travel an hour. Sometimes you have travel two hours. In the states, if you look at Twitter. They're begging for that kind of access now. Right. Right. They're, they're absolutely begging. And so when these RAM clinics started, a lot of them didn't do methadone because there were nurse practitioners or strict regulations around methadone. That's changed uh, quite a bit. Though the reason that people were um, upset about the methadone clinics is that they found a way to leverage the billing system to optimize optimize income, right? Uh, and uh, the way the billing was set up, there was no uh, incentive to offer all those other services. So when, I, for example, when I work in a hospital, right, uh, you, you saw in the rapid access, clinic, what is it? We had a nurse, we had a social worker, uh, we had uh, two case managers sometimes, uh, we had uh, somebody that would come sometimes from the detox to walk them over. Who's paying for that? Yeah, uh, that's the government. The government's paying for that because they they fund the hospitals with that kind of funds and support. Right. When somebody opens up a a private clinic, so to speak, you're you're just you're getting the doctor's income from charging the government per person visit. You're not getting any of that overhead stuff. Uh, most people that receive addiction care are likely receiving it from from one of these clinics. Not a RAM clinic, but from a from one of these. Yeah, just yeah. I mean, by it volume. also depends what you call uh, clinics, right? Like, uh, you know, in terms of addiction uh, clinics. But but for methadone, absolutely. Yeah. And and the reason is because you know when methadone, in, at least in the past, like in the states and otherwise, when you have too many carries, when you have too much uh, loose uh, restrictions, people die of uh, overdoses of uh, methadone, right? And right. So you have to have these rigid standards. You get audited. You're very critically. And and you know, in fact, you know, when you think about it. They were auditing these methadone clinics. Okay. So say if I was working in that clinic, I would get audited on a regular basis. They'd review the charts. The, the government or CPSO or whoever could have said, hey, you have to do A, B, and C, D, and E too. Yeah. Right? So, I, I mean, it's hard for me to fault those clinics because... No, no, and, even, and I'm uh, not trying to do that. I'm just trying to generalize it. Is it first of all, I didn't know that... And, and these the, RAM the, clinics, I think they're, they're they're flawed too. I mean, they're, they're getting better. But when they were rolling them out, you know, uh, we were pushing for things like case management, things like counseling, things like that. Maybe having somebody with expertise, you know, in addiction medicine or having a training program for it. Yeah. But a lot of these people who started working there sort of learned on the job as they went, right? And so, so I don't know. But, but from my end, I think just having a drop-in clinic four or five times a week, you know, yeah. where you can get help for addiction is phenomenal, right? And it's government 100%. covered, yeah. all, all that kind of uh, kind of stuff. Uh, and, and I think it's... Um, I think we're very lucky to have it and hopefully they keep trying to do better, right? Because right. there's always a gap in whatever you, you offer. Well, sure. Just even where are they, right? How far do you have to drive to get to one? It's not a, it's not a virtual visit, certainly yeah, not, yeah, not yeah, these yeah. days. So, I mean, this is a good model, we think, right? I, I, I think mean, it's a phenomenal model. Yeah. I, I, think yeah. it's, I think it's fantastic. I, I think there, there's gaps in it, right? And, and I think over time, uh, they, they keep improving. They keep improving those gaps. Yeah. You know, so when a lot of them came out, some of them only did buprenorphine, some of them had two hours a day. When COVID came, a lot of them shut down. Yeah. Yes. Right, so the government ones, they all, a lot of these ones, they just close shop. Like, well, we're closed now, right? And so, uh, but but some of these, anyways, I don't know. 
So with my new role, so I, I've just started, as you know, just started going, I'm now back into the hospital instead of working in a uh, in a detox and now I'm working in the emergency room. And so now I, I have this, um, I'm in a unique position. I, typically I, I tried to get people engaging them so they would come back and see me. That was always my- Before, yeah, that yeah, was yeah, of that, course. In every role I've had. Now, now my role is to engage, be just as engaging, hopefully even, even more so, but engage them to come back to- Iraq clinic, right? So that they're not building a, an emergency room that isn't specialized in addiction care. We do a lot of great addiction care there, but it's not it's not the best place to get addiction care. Um, you know, it's a it's a it's a tumultuous place. Lots of stuff happening. Lots of lots is, of unwell is that people. your main goal is to try to help people connect to other services? One hundred percent, one hundred percent. Like it's, um, I mean, that's the idea. Is we're not going to solve all their addiction needs in a, in one ED visit. So the idea is is that instead of coming back to the ED to get care again, if if it's not a if it's not a something that requires an ED urgent visit, then you can come five days a week the in the morning between nine and eleven to our to our walk in clinic, right? And that's the walk in addiction clinic where you're going to get a specialized nurse that does addiction care. You're going to get a specialized case manager that does addiction care, and you're going to get a specialized physician that just does addiction care. Like that's what they do. So, uh, so yeah, so now it's kind of a engagement by proxy, I guess, kind of thing, right? Yeah, no, and if I think about how to design that position in an ideal way, it probably would involve about 20 to 40% of your time being flexible, right? To be able to walk the person over, show up at the clinic, greet them there, that kind of stuff. I would see if there's a way for you to have some kind of a work phone, right? That yeah, you could text, 100%, call. 100%, yeah, yeah. Uh, especially if the people that are coming in and out, in and out, in and out, right? Yeah. They, they need that, uh, that, that, that relationship. Uh, and then also that intensive case management that you do uh, you do quite well, where is how do you make sure they have a primary care provider? Do they have an OHIP card? Are they connected to Ontario Works or OBSP yeah. or... Uh, uh, housing or, or all that kind but, of stuff. But in my new role, it, it's it's a one and done. So it, it's 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 literally trying to connect to the different case managers that would be available to them. I won't be ongoing with any of those folks. And you know, even in these new encounters that I'm just like, how do I get a hold? <laughs> like, it got to avoid that the end of the visit being well. How do I get a hold of you again? Um, because at this point, we haven't. It, it, you don't. You you go to this clinic and you're gonna have somebody. Yeah, who's no, you can definitely way better uh, do that. Me. No, you can definitely do that. The the problem is the the biggest gap in care has to do with transitions, right? You know this. Yeah, I know this. It's that warm this tra- doing that warm transfer. Yeah, right? but even even then, you know, like I think it's just uh, it's yeah, just there's so many connotations with uh, transfer, right? Yeah. Uh, and uh, and we forget the value of attachment and uh, connection. You know, when you trust someone, when you uh, care for yeah. someone, it's it's just unfortunate because all these uh, organizations are getting funds to try to solve this uh, problem problem and there's no way to really figure out what the, what is that effective component well we don't know well we know that we know that these encounters in rack work right we know that that, that they get great care so, well, well, they get great care, but the the dropout rate's quite high, you know. So, out of the people who get referred, only maybe like uh, depending where, what it Ted, uh, what it whatever show up. Uh, places like Ottawa have done other things, so they do um, they they do callbacks. So after somebody comes in, they'll they'll call the person back a couple right. of times, yep. have them come in. Uh, they'll uh, and we've just started doing that in our rack yeah, again. Yeah. I think we did it years ago for a pilot, but now the case manager in the morning is doing follow up in the afternoon. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so you look at all the eMERGE referrals. You came through. Hey, you know, you're seen at the eMERGE. You offer this clinic. Do you want to come by? Yeah, not quite doing that yet. But if you've come to Rack, if we got you in the door once and you yeah. have, we haven't seen you in a few weeks, yeah. we're gonna we're gonna give you a call and follow up. Yeah. If we have your permission to do that, which we have to seek at the beginning, because yeah. you know everyone's in a different position and we don't want to violate people's uh, you know uh, confidentiality or, or you know if a, if a spouse calls them answers the phone and it's not uh, they weren't aware that there even was an addiction issue you have to be very mindful of those sorts absolutely, of things absolutely you know. um, yeah I, I mean I think we're really really lucky here to have this uh, program like I, I can't think of anywhere else where I would imagine this happening you know I would love it if they had this kind of thing for other medical conditions like primary care and stuff like that where you could actually get that full workup that full physical as opposed to having to wait yeah. uh, all the time uh, for it and uh, yeah no, we're, we're super super we're super lucky and I think we sometimes don't appreciate what we uh, what we have well 100% we don't I mean I, I I can speak from speak from my own perspective when you know when I went to when I went to this conference and we're sharing ideas you know we broke off into these little uh, these these little subgroups or focus groups uh, you know splinter groups whatever you want to call them and we came up with ideas I'm like okay why don't we get the you know the RAM clinic to do this and do that and I'm sitting there with like four different addiction doctors like what What's huh? around? <laughs> and I just found that so astonishing, right? Because it's like, 
Uh, and these guys are, they, they knew their stuff, right? They're really good. These been, they've been doing it for a decade each, but they really, they didn't, um, it, 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 it made you just appreciate how siloed, uh, this country, we have live in a really big geographically <laughs> vast country, right? And how siloed those provinces can be. And if they didn't have one, well, uh, you know, I, I, I'm also siloed cause I didn't know they didn't have one. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. And then the other thing happens for rural, rural areas. What do you do about that? Right. Like it's different in an urban center versus like rural yeah, areas yeah. and traveling and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Even know? my own naivete, like I, when they say, they're like, Oh yeah. Uh, because all I knew is they're from Quebec at this point. Right. So you're like, what in the, uh, the hinderlands of, <laughs> of Quebec, like in some rural place. <laughs> Of course, it's like... It's Montreal. Yeah, it's like, no, I, I live in Montreal. <laughs> yeah. Downtown. <laughs> yeah, and you know, it, it's, it's fascinating, you know, because like, I, I started like looking at people on Twitter and stuff who talk about uh, addiction medicine, harm reduction, hospital-based care. They're, they're fighting for all these things in the States that we've had for like five, seven years. Yeah. Like uh, the, the methadone regulations, who can prescribe, who can change the dose, buprenorphine. You know, if you use uh, slow-release oral morphine as an addiction medication, you can like go to jail. The DA will find you if you prescribe this, all this, this stuff. This is Cadian in, uh, yeah, in yeah. Canada. Yeah, it's a, just a treatment for opiate use disorder yeah. here. Uh, and it's just, uh, they're, they're fighting for all the stuff that we have here, right? And my mind goes to, what are, what are we actually missing? Because if, if, if we have a place where the overdose deaths are through the roof like United States and the experts there are fighting to get the treatments that we offer here and over here the overdose death rates are, are through the roof, what, what are we missing? You know, and, and luckily with these drop-in clinics, you can have somebody coming in, you can get them to come in regularly. Yeah. Well, what, what, what else is involved in terms of shifting some of the morbidity, the mortality, the death, the infections, the... Uh, hospitalizations, things like that. Well, I think that's, you know, one of the reasons we're doing this, right, is to get our stories out there. Like, you know, we've got a, a vast audience of people and, uh, you know, a lot of them are in, you know, different different countries and things like that. So it's, I think that's one of the reasons we're doing this, right, is to spread is to spread this story and get, you know, feedback from other people and, uh, you know, and to try to build a dialogue. I mean, that's, yeah, isn't that then, why we're doing this? Yeah, no, and, and even uh, for for me, you know, I, I really see the, uh, the RAM clinic uh, as a backbone for any substance use at treatment, a place you can drop in, check in uh, regularly. Uh, if you have to worry about alcohol withdrawal or you need a medication that can be provided just for whatever withdrawal or to keep you around and then use that uh, relationship to connect to other things, yeah. uh, things as well, right? And so... No, I think that's great. And and what I have appreciated learning about today is that, you know, kind of this, uh, you know, I, I didn't know why there was this, you know, kind of animosity towards the, uh, towards the methadone providers, but I, you've put some context into it and, and I get it, you know, I, I, now it makes more sense to me, but, but these guys are doing the same work that we're doing. They're working with the same people and they, they're, they don't care any less than you or I care about the outcomes of those people. Oh, they're, they're absolutely invested in it, you know, and I think the, uh, yeah, I mean, we'll see how models evolve and, and all that stuff. I mean, you have to remember these um, these methadone clinics, uh, they came around when uh, there was nothing, nothing around. Right. And it's not like any of these hospitals were offering that uh, care and treatment. Some of the providers that worked there, uh, some of them worked in the eMERGE, some of them worked in the hospital setting, they were seeing people die of overdoses. They're like, how do I solve this? And then all of a sudden they, they learned, oh, what's methadone? How does it work? And a lot of colleagues I know that have been doing this for 20, uh, 30 years, that's how they started. They weren't trained in working with substance use disorders. They were just seeing the death. Right. And when you have a treatment that reduces it, like say, for example, uh, you're in, I don't know, like Timmins or Sudbury, even London, right? Even London, because people don't just live 30 minutes within London, right? Right. And it, like, wouldn't it be better to have somebody be able to go somewhere that's 10 minutes away from them than to travel to London? Yeah. And I'm telling you, just like family medicine, there's docs everywhere. You can convince any of them to do substance use care. Right. Right. Like, and so, I mean, I, I don't want to be an apologist for, for whatever I, I don't, cause there's a lot of uh, resentment, uh, you know, among towards addiction um, medicine docs. So even doing the RAM work we do, there's a lot of resentment. You'll see that in the, um, in the news and in, in Twitter. Uh, there's also a lot of resentment towards these uh, methadone clinics uh, as sure. well. But, but kind of in a way, sorry to interrupt it. Like, it's almost like the, as I'm understanding it now, it's like kind of those methadone providers are kind of, maybe they were the OG RAM clinic in a way, right? Well, they absolutely were. 
They were. So, they absolutely were. Yeah, right? So it's uh, not, finding all these workarounds, getting the method on there. Yeah. Uh, they, they would get audited regularly. So if something bad happened, you get in a lot of uh, that trouble. That really uh, bad for them when yeah. it happened. Like if, it, you know, if they did something that if they, you know, yeah. pushed the limit too much and then they, yeah. you know, got in trouble. Yeah. You weren't allowed to prescribe a benzos in addition. You had to go up a fixed dose at a fixed amount of time. If you went up too fast, uh, they, they'd get upset with you uh, for it. You know, if somebody broke an arm and they needed pain meds, that was a whole other uh, thing in, it, in itself. Uh, but they were pretty much going to regions where it wasn't there and maybe now it's not the ideal form of a care but even these um, traditionally methadone clinics are now offering buprenorphine they're doing alcohol withdrawal management they're doing um, anti-craving meds for uh, for alcohol yes. uh, which is uh, which is great you know and and occasionally you do get these hospitals that work like yours do where they have a case manager a nurse maybe a social worker yeah. doing all this wraparound stuff that's not actually the uh, the norm right and right. some of these places they won't do benzodiazepine withdrawal they won't do stimulant use disorder they won't do cannabis use disorder, though they're really sort of a circumscribes because it's still not clear what um, an addiction medicine physician or nurse practitioner actually uh, actually does. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's different, different. I mean, everyone's got a different practice that they've built, right? That a different, a different level of expertise and a different level of comfort. I mean, we, um, you know, and it's, it's all about, you know, bringing awareness to folks and, and, uh, you know, into these different communities, right? I mean, that's what we're, we're, we're trying to do. Yeah, and it'll be really nice if this model uh, does does spread, right? So the provinces in Canada that don't uh, have it, and definitely in the uh, the states, and a lot of places in the states are using what they'll call a bridge model that goes from the emerge. Yeah. So they'll do from emerge to a drop in a clinic, but maybe there's a play time eventually you have a drop in all the time, right? Like, well, it's definitely in the seven years I've been here, it's expanded significantly, right? Yeah. So that how many hospitals were doing it seven years ago? In Ontario. Yeah, you're right now. Everyone is expected to. Yeah, have one. now it's kind of all over the place. And, yeah. and we'll put, uh, Medify Group puts out a great list of yeah. the RAM clinics in yeah. Ontario. We're yeah. going to post that in the. Yeah, uh, let's post that there. In, I think in, that'll be great. In yeah. the description. And uh, so at least people in Ontario. Uh, we'll know where to where to find one of these one of these places, and yeah. and then they're open. Uh, like I can only speak to Toronto from my own knowledge, but they're open at different times during the day, five days a week. You can find one. And uh, some are open in the afternoon, some are open in the most are open in the morning, but you know, you can pretty well find one anytime and you can, all you got to do is show up. Yeah, this Metify thing, I think, is something worth chatting about. It won't be it won't be too long. It's m e t a p h i dot c a, and I'm so impressed with what they've uh, what they've done. Yeah, uh, they have an email listserv. You know, where yes. when I started working in this field, I, I'd say, "Hey, I've got somebody in on methadone. They're in pain. What would you use?" Uh, and then I get four or five responses. You know, you can pick the one that's best suited for your practice. Uh, they have all these guides. So they had these like guides that were free PDFs that I would give to all the trainees coming through. I yes. had like you have like 50 or 100 in my office, I would just hand them out when trainings would be there. They've included advanced protocols, you know, for the ER, for hospital based care, for outpatient care, for all these uh, kinds of things. And like you said, they have a map. Yeah. So they have a map in Ontario of clinics that are offering this uh, this kind of care, and you can just go there uh, for it, right? And they, I think they have a couple of community practices, a lot of talks on a regular basis. Anyone can sign up for. Yes, yes, they do. And well, so, so so Medify offers two a, a great components. So one is for the, the listserv parts, and uh, and and the workshops you're talking about are for people that provide addiction care or, or, or provide care and would like to know more about addiction. Yeah. And then the other the list that we're going to put out as well is the uh, uh, is is just the list of these clinics, which is for everybody. Right. Yeah, Any, anybody can in go Ontario, there. You, you yeah, don't need to Ontario. be an addiction provider. You don't need to have a family doctor. You don't. If you're in Ontario, you can just get yourself to those clinic and get that care. So that's yeah. that, that's the two parts. So yes, I, I absolutely agree that uh, you and, know Medify does some amazing work. And I would love it if there was like a hub like that almost everywhere. Right? Yeah. You know, uh, whichever state, whichever this, whichever that. You know, it's done wonders in reducing uh, stigma and also helping um, regular physicians pick up the uh, skill set. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's, uh, is there anything else you wanted to say about uh, the RAM model of care? Well, well I mean, I, I, think, uh, I think this is a good uh, starting point. Yep. Uh, the people we work with need more, but let's get the starting point spread and then figure out what that other part that's needed. Sounds good. Is. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for watching. If you like what you saw, please feel free to like and subscribe. That way you'll get notified when we come out with new content. We try to come out with new content about uh, every week or so, so... Anyway, thanks again and see you soon.